Hi, I'm Bill Crystal. Welcome back to Conversations. I'm very pleased to be joined uh, again today by Doug Sosnick, the veteran Democratic strategist, political director in the Clinton White House from, I think, six years of the Clinton presidency, 1994 to 2000, advised on dozens uh, of uh, de Democratic campaigns over the years, often very successfully, really widely regarded and respected in Washington as, as a, not just a political strategist who knows the, the, the ins and outs of campaign tactics, but a real thinker about American politics, the two parties, where we've been, where we're going. Uh, people look forward to his monthly memos, which uh, lay out some of his thinking on this. A very good piece in the New York Times uh, earlier this week. We're speaking on, what, the 14th of February? And so uh, on sort of Biden and Trump. Anyway, uh, we had a conversation about, what, six, seven months ago, and that stands up well, too. So, Doug, thanks for joining me again. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here, Bill. Okay, so, Doug, well, let's just maybe we'll talk about where we are in the election, Biden and Trump, and then a little bit more broadly, since you're so good at that, too, at the sort of where's the, not just where's the election, but where's the country and what things might happen that might surprise us. But where where's the race? I mean, you've, you've been through so many of these. So give, give us the kind of the briefing. Well, I think if you think about where we are today compared to the last time we spoke in, in early June, I would say uh, two things were kind of cross currents. One is, in one way, the race hasn't really changed in the sense is that both Biden and Trump have obviously solidified their positions as the likely nominees. And I think there was probably a fair amount of skepticism uh, back last June about whether these two guys would actually emerge out of this uh, process and be the nominees. And um, it appears they are. And I think for, for different reasons, by the way, I think Trump uh, is, is going to be the nominee largely because of his support with the, the base of the party. And despite the fact there are a lot of Republicans who don't really want to support him, um, they feel forced to because they fear the political retribution of Republicans uh, at the base level. And in the case of Biden, uh, his, his support his ability to go through a primary without a serious opponent is largely due not to the base, but to the political elites in the party who decided that it's less of a risk to have Biden running again uh, against Trump than it would be to have an open primary. And so for completely different reasons, uh, I think they're obviously in a much stronger position um, within their own parties now uh, than they were back in June. Um, what's different, and it is different, is the, is the race, I would say, from the beginning of last year until around the middle uh, to end of October, uh, was pretty static. And it had Biden uh, ahead of Trump, uh, both nationally uh, and in the battleground states. Uh, it was consistent. It wasn't an overwhelming lead, but it was a, a lead of, you know, three, two, three, four points pretty much consistently. The polls never changed. In the last three and a half, four months, um, the race has changed. And it started, I would say, around the end of October um, with a series of polls that came out. Uh, there was a six state battleground New York Times poll, which had Trump ahead uh, uh, in all six battleground states and pretty significantly. Uh, the NBC poll that came out in early uh, November uh, had Trump ahead for the first time in their polling. Uh, and their Wall Street Journal poll came out in November which not only showed the same uh, uh, Trump advantage, uh, but they asked, they asked a series of questions which haven't changed in the last three and a half months, which compared voters' views of what life was like when Trump was president compared to what life is like with Biden as president. And, and Trump, the Trump presidency across almost every single issue was overwhelmingly remembered to be much more positive um, than the Biden uh, presidency. And so if you fast forward from the end of October till, till now, um, that has been the pattern. It's been a consistent pattern. Now, I would say Trump has, Trump's uh, support has not really increased in that time, um, but Biden's support has gone down. And uh, there are probably a combination of factors. Uh, I, I do believe uh, that the... Uh, October 7th events and, the, and what happened following up uh, in Israel and Gaza, I think has hurt um, Biden with his, his base. Um, and I do think there's a general sense that, that Biden is really not on top of his presidency. His job approval is now uh, in the upper 30s, which is really, um, really, uh, the, it's, oh, it's the worst that we've had since Jimmy Carter was president. Uh, 
Um, so we're now in a phase uh, now going in several months where Trump is a clear um, favorite. I would, I would say advantage and maybe favorite. Uh, we haven't really seen a lot of polling that's come out in the last week um, since the special counsel's report. Uh, so we'll have to see if Biden's um, numbers will go, go down will go down even further. My hunch is um, because we're in a divided country politically, Trump is still, despite his advantages, he's still, you know, at the upper end of his ceiling of around 46 or 47 percent. He never once had a 50 percent job approval one time as president. Um, so I think he's pretty much at his high end. Uh, and I think Biden is probably at the low end of the range. Uh, but he really does need to pick up, you know, to, to get to at least the low to mid 40s if he's going to win. That's terrific. There's so many things to follow up on there and very, very helpful overview. So let me just pick up on a couple of different things. I was struck as, as by the one um, uh, poll answer, uh, question and answer you mentioned from, I guess, late October on uh, whose presidency did you prefer it? Is there, you know, retrospectively Trump or Biden currently? I do think that's kind of, undue. well, A, you couldn't ask that question, of course, at any time in the last hundred years, right? Since we haven't had a, an ex-president running against a current president and the most recent ex-president. So it is a weird race, a little different from the normal challenger incumbent dynamics, I think. I think we discussed this in June, perhaps, where the people learn more about the challenger. It helps them if they like the challenger. It hurts them if they don't like the challenger. Uh, it hurts the challenger if, we, if people don't like him as they see more of him. Here, everyone has seen Trump for four years as president and Biden for three plus years as president. And I just feel like that's a pretty fundamental number, isn't it? If people think the Trump presidency was better for me than the Biden presidency, I mean, am I? I just, I just was struck by that. I'd love, I'd love your comments on that. I mean, because people are still talking about the races. If it's your standard incumbent versus, I'm sorry, challenger versus incumbent, right. it doesn't quite feel that way, though. Well, you're right about that. I think there are probably three reasons uh, for that. Um, the first is that um, that uh, people remember. The, their economic situation in 2019 before COVID uh, was in a much better position than it is now. And, you know, remember that, you know, we've gone through the biggest, highest rate of inflation in our country since the early 1980s. And majority of Americans were not either alive or were too young to remember what it was like in the early 1980s. So this is the first experience that a majority of Americans have ever had with inflation. And inflation's like no other economic downturn in terms of the psychological impact that it has on people. Um, and, and I think that even though the rate of inflation has gone down, um, the prices haven't gone down, and people are still feeling the aftershocks of, of an incredible period of, of uh, prices going up. And until recently, wages did not keep pace with that, particularly food prices that are up 25% more uh, than they were in 2019. And all goods and services are up 19% more compared to 2019. I think the second problem uh, is one of expectations that were set by Biden when he became president, that the adults were back in charge and that we were going to have calmness. I think if you ask, if you ask me anything about a single issue of why Trump lost in 2020, and I think the country felt exhausted from him and just didn't really have the stomach and appetite for four more years of chaos. And so a big part of the Biden candidacy um, was the adults coming back and putting order. And I think that for a combination of factors, some of which have nothing to do with Biden, some of which do have to do to Biden, I think the people, despite the fact that you can look at Consumer confidence has gone up in the last 90 days and a bunch of other metrics and unemployment is still low and inflation, as I mentioned, is, is down. Is I think that people feel a tremendous amount of anxiety uh, about their life and about their future and that the adults did not come back and make things more calm. And then the third, which is obvious, we're now clocking in at over three years of Biden being three years older now than he was three years ago. I do think that uh, how his, in the context of what I just mentioned, um, I think he does really appear um, older to people, not steady to people, and not reassuring. And I think those combinations um, have given Trump uh, uh, an advantage, which, was, as I mentioned earlier, we've now seen show up in the polling. Yeah, the advantage being mostly that 
Biden's drifted down, not that he's gained that much Trump, right? Well, but they also have fonder memories of their economic yes, well, situation. That's good, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, that Trump can say wacky things and mm-hmm. frankly, I, deplorable and dangerous things about NATO and about God knows what. But, and also, I think that the you know the issue of the border is both a real issue, but also a proxy. Right. It's a real issue in the sense that there's no metric you can look at about border crossings or anything else that's been done since Biden became president. Uh, and be able to fashion a positive story out of that. Um, uh, and, and also you see the impact now all across America in these you know, blue states and blue cities like New York and Chicago and Denver, Colorado, where these migrants, illegal illegal crossings are, are they're now being flooded into these areas. And, and and people feel the impact every day when they're walking around and, and, and see and see these people sleeping on the streets and and the, and the safety. But it's also a proxy for what I mentioned earlier about just the sense that things are not in control here now um, and that there's not really a strong government in place um, to, to bring our lives back to normal. And I'm struck how much the retrospective, maybe slightly inaccurate, but whatever view of the things were much better when Trump or somewhat better when Trump was there. Um, uh, it helps him so much, right? I mean, if someone like me hears what he says about NATO and I think, uh, A, that's incredibly irresponsible and dangerous and B, it actually suggests what a second Trump term would be like and it would be much more dangerous than a first Trump term. But I have the impression voters, you know, they hear this stuff, it's all kind of noise. Trump's just being Trump. He says these things. But, you know, they they the thing they have to compare that's fairly concrete is their is the Trump first term, or I suppose more accurately, the memory of the Trump first term and the perception of the current Biden term. And I feel like that's that gives Trump a, a cushion that a normal challenger who said these kinds of things doesn't have. He, I mean, he's weirdly advantaged by being both the challenger, the outsider, the, guy, the change candidate, and hey, he was president. I mean, there's not, there's not that much to worry about. Things were okay when Trump was president. Well, if you're right. I think that um, most people have sort of priced into the stock Trump saying crazy things, um, but 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 above and beyond the economic narrative that Trump will be able to put out uh, about when he was president um, compared to now um, on prices and inflation and, and, and the rest, um, he's also going to be able to say, regardless of whether or not you know he deserves any credit for it or not, when he was president though, didn't have war in Europe, didn't have war in the Middle East. Uh, and aren't getting closer to war every day in Asia. Um, so I think, again, that reinforces this second point that I made earlier about yeah. um, the, the reason a lot of people supported Biden was to have normalcy back in people's lives, more control with adults in charge. You stress that Biden's job approval hasn't recovered. And I think some people I've talked to over the last two, three months sort of keep, have kept on saying, hoping maybe, well, it's the economy, there's a lag when there's an economic recovery or when inflation goes down, uh, but gradually that eventually kicks in and it should affect the job approval. And I, I think some of the, the intelligent Democrats I've spoken with are a little panicked, it's too strong, but concerned that so far it's not translating. I mean, voters seem able to say, I have more confidence in the economy, more consumer confidence. They even kind of know inflation is not as bad as it was, but that doesn't, so far hasn't really translated to a job well, there's approval a, number. there's a lag. Uh, and that's normal. Uh, but what I will say is when I, I worked for President Clinton for six years, and as we all remember, those of us old enough can remember, and we had our ups and our downs. But when uh, someone asked me when was a real low point for us, uh, or for me, and, and that was um, after the uh, 1994 midterm elections, where the Democrats got, got destroyed, uh, and Clinton's job approval was not that far away from where Biden's is now. Um, what really, really concerned me, I remember, was sometime in that spring of 95 when I was walking through an airport and Clinton was on television uh, and no one was watching him. Hmm. And that that really struck me. That struck fear with me. Uh, and I do worry a little bit that um, at some point the public is going to shut down uh, on Biden uh, in terms of giving him another look. And he's got two uh, related but different challenges right now. One is to inst- inspire and motivate his base to to not only support him, but to turn out. And it's far from a given that that's going to happen. Uh, and then the other, of course, is with the swing voters 
uh, in, in the handful of states that will determine the next president, if it's a close election, um, his, his numbers with the swing voters are, are, are lagging um, his overall numbers, which are quite bad. The kicker of your New York Times piece was that disqualif- everyone's, that was a disqualifying Trump might not be enough or likely wouldn't be enough. You can't just do that. I think Democrats have really been counting on that to a considerable degree. I yeah, mean, they think they have uh, people who, who forget that or discount that. I don't think uh, they've either thought about or uh, interpreted properly uh, one of the lessons from the 2016 campaign in which Hillary Clinton's campaign was almost entirely predicated on an anti-Trump message. And, and you just simply can't run for president of the United States uh, without giving people a reason to vote for you. Now, look, at the end of the day, if Biden were to win, it's going to be largely because of opposition to Trump. But he does have an obligation, as I point out in the New York Times piece, uh, to do what Ronald Reagan did in 1980. Uh, well, the country didn't want to vote for Carter. Um, but they had real reservations about Reagan. They had reservations about its age. They had reservations about his temperament. They had reservations about whether or not he was a little bit, you know, kind of a crazy right winger. Uh, and despite the fact that Carter uh, was in the low, high 30s or low 40s for the entire campaign, it was a three way race. It was only at the end, after the only debate, the end of October, did they coalesce around Reagan and support him. And it wasn't because Reagan did so well in the debate and he killed Carter. It was that Reagan did well enough. And so Biden has got to get to a point that he's doing well enough to be able to make the race about Trump. And so at the end of all this, I'd say it's probably a 30-70 ratio. 30% of Biden's message has got to be a a positive reason for people to support him. And 70% can be about Trump. um, But you, you can't make it 100% about Trump. Talk through, even through these actual presidential campaigns. Let's maybe just bracket the very small chance, I suppose, that Biden steps aside. Some of us might have urged him to, might urge him to consider that. Uh, or the small Trump, the chance that Trump, something gets tripped up or uh, by Nikki Haley or by the courts decisively. Um, and so what, what would you be looking, what are the moments, what do you, what do you look for now over the next, how many months are we away? I can't have lost track. Eight months. We're almost like nine that. months away. And, um, the longest, the longest general election in modern political history, we'll have, um, over 60% of the country doesn't want to see either one of these people run. Yeah. What is the implication of how, how does that affect everything i feel like we don't yeah. even know quite how that we've never really been through something quite like this have we i mean no uh no and I, well we, a little bit in 2016 with hillary right. and, and uh, I'll, I'll come to that in terms of what to watch for in a moment okay. but um yeah. um both the, right now biden's uh favorable unfavorable unfav very unfavorable about the same as trump's um so you really have two candidates that are that are sort of mirror one each mirror each other so the race, I believe, if it's close, will be back to what it has been. There, there are six swing states that are going to determine the next president of the United States. Five of them were the ones that voted for the winning candidate in 2016 and 2020, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Georgia, uh, and Arizona. And then the sixth state that I would add is Nevada, um, which actually right now Trump is is is, is leading uh, by more than the other states. And these are two states that narrowly voted for Clinton and for and for Biden. Um, so we're, we're, we're back to the same handful of states, which represent less than 15% of the U.S. population. Um, so the, the race starts out nine months out with, uh, remember, we re, they re, reallocated the Electoral College now based on reapportionment redistricting, which is a net six positive for Trump and Republicans due to population changes. So Trump starts out with 235 electoral votes. Biden has 226 electoral votes. So you have 77 electoral votes at stake that are going to determine who the next president of the United States is. And so back to your question, um, uh, traditionally, there are the same swing voters generally in our country in the last 50 years. uh, The swing voters that, that Reagan carried in 1980 are the same core group of swing voters that Biden needs to carry in 2024, which are a couple of them are the independent voters, which we all know about, uh, 
moderate voters uh, and suburban voters. Um, but there are a couple of additional groups of voters that uh, I think are, are going to be important to watch uh, in this election because they're both so unpopular. One is third party candidates. Um, uh, we saw that they made the difference in 2016, when, which is the last time you had two very unpopular nominees. And I think about 18 percent of the people who voted in 2016 disliked both candidates and Trump carried them by 17 points. Um, so one is third parties and what kind of impact they can have. Um, if you go back to Michigan, uh, I think there were, uh, I think there were 175,000 third party votes uh, in 16 in a state that Trump carried by a little bit more than 10,000 votes. And the vast majority of those people who voted third, fourth, fifth party would have voted for Hillary in a two person race. And you saw in, in uh, 20, 2000 in Florida, we had, I think, 95,000 people voted for Ralph Nader, you know, in an election that Bush won by less than 400 votes. So because the uniqueness of both of these candidates being unpopular, one is the third party impact. And then the second are what I call double haters, the people that dislike both candidates. And as I mentioned a minute ago, they, they were decisive in 2016. And so I think that's going to be a key swing, swing group of swing voters. Um, in 2024. And I guess I might add a third one, um, which are, uh, I don't know if this has been branded, but I would call Bill Crystal Republicans. Um, they're about 20, 25 percent of Republicans uh, who, uh, who who really dislike Trump and don't want to vote for Trump. Uh, but if you go back to Biden's weaknesses right now, um, there's some of the people that are really balking at voting for Biden uh, because of how little confidence they have in him. The fear that he's not going to get through a second term and that Kamala Harris is going to be president. Um, and these are the ones, this is a group amongst the group that need reassurance um, that Biden is up to four more years. Yeah, so those are those are Bill Crystal adjacent Republicans. Uh, or <laughs> those of us who are real ex-Republicans. I'm not, not I'm voting against Trump, period. But but I agree. I still know, of course, many such people, and we all do, and and when we and they, they exist. And there's a Pretty decent size, enough to make a difference size of these kind of, well, yes, and, and, certainly and, uh, of, of, it, of, of Biden voters in 2020 but, who probably voted Republican down ticket or voted Republican some in 2022 and uh, or and very open to uh, convincing themselves that even though they would have preferred it wouldn't be Trump, maybe Trump isn't quite as dangerous as people like me think. And Biden's totally out of his, he's lost control and he's too old. That's where I think the age thing, incidentally, I just want to comment on it. Really, it gives a kind of neutral excuse for those swingish, Republican-ish Biden 2020 voters to say, you know, I voted from once and, and I think he's, you know, he's been, it hasn't been great, but it's not terrible. Okay. we're, But, you know, that was for four years. That was supposed to be a transitional thing. And now they want me to vote for him again and look how he's doing in some of these at the press conference the other night and so forth. I feel like it's a, it's an easy way for those people to slide back towards towards a Trump voter, certainly to not voting for Biden. Well, I would say two things. One is we go back to Bill Crystal adjacent Republicans for a minute. <laughs> if you look at the 2022 20, midterm elections and the, the failure, despite all the advantages in the world of the Republicans to take back the U.S. Senate, uh, the day after the midterms in which for the second cycle in a row, Republicans uh, did not take back the Senate when they should have. One of the reasons that Mitch McConnell said in his day after press conference was they lost, they didn't take control of the Senate in these swing states because of Republican voters defecting um, away from the Republican, right wing Republican nominees. Um, the other thing I'll mention uh, about maybe explaining why Either people are dismissing Trump or having you know selective memory about what it was like. Um, I think there are a couple. There's there's one thing for sure, which I think it really is an indictment of a sort of American government and leaders in politics. We're, we're getting we're getting the kind of disconnect you used to see in Italy, where you'd have forty governments in forty years and no one really cared because right. what was going on in politics and government really had nothing to do with people's lives and. and you know, you had 40 governments in 40 years and they were like, OK, we had 40 governments in 40 years, but life went on and nothing really changed. And I think we're unfortunately getting uh, a little bit like that in America. Uh, and there's much less enthusiasm and energy, by the way, for this 2024 election than there was in the 2022 election. 
And I think you're going to see turnout down. Turnout's been high for the last four or five election cycles. And I think you're going to see turnout go down. Uh, you're seeing, you know, viewership on every metric about politics going way down, whether it's watching cable television, subscribing to newspapers, tuning into debates. Uh, and the other thing, though, which is, I think, really uh, dangerous is elections used to be about issues and choices. And you elect someone and then they implement whatever they ran on. Um, the issues that are going to decide this election and the implications of whether it's a Trump presidency or a Biden presidency in terms of tax policy and a whole host of issues, they're not talking about the issues that are meaningful in terms of people's lives and what's going to happen when someone wins the election. And so there's really not uh, so much of a, a ballot test on, on the substantive direction of our country as it is the context of an evenly divided country, largely based on tribal politics in which education is the best predictor, and the question of the personalities of two people that you don't like either one of them and they're running. But but regard if you watch this election in terms of what the policy positions are, it will have it's got very little to do with what's going to happen from a governing standpoint in 2025. Yeah, the and the degree to which Trump so in Georgia in 2022, to just follow up on your example, Herschel Walker was just too unacceptable a candidate, and so he lost. So some Republicans deserted him. But right now, Trump's clearly ahead in Georgia, I think. And um, so that for me, it's a little crazy to say, I believe me, I would not have voted for Herschel Walker either, but it's a little crazy to say that Herschel Walker is more dangerous to the country as one senator out of 100 <laughs> than Donald Trump as president of the United States, who's going to you know pull out of NATO and all these other things and you know staged a coup, and we won't even go into it. But that's not quite where these swing voters are right now. I think some of our Democratic friends, maybe our friends in the Biden White House and campaign, are sort of assume that, well, obviously, if you're against Herschel Walker, you got to be against Donald Trump. You know? But I think they underestimate just, yeah, the the degree to which it can't just be a referendum on 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 Trump, as you said, and and then the age issue with with Biden, and I, 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 I it's it, it's a little puzzle. I mean, you, at first blush, you, it does seem sensible to say, well, come on, why won't it be twenty twenty two again? Right. But, but those are know, Trumpy, those are Trumpy candidates who lost in Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona. Except Trumpy candidates aren't quite the same thing as Trump, right? Well, and you know, we talked to. A lot about this. We talked about it last June. I mean, the, the fault line in American politics now is really education levels, and and the reason that those six states uh, that we mentioned earlier are the, the only competitive states right now is, with the exception of of Nevada, which is vote, voted Democratic, even though it's towards the bottom of education levels. Um, the other five states are all kind of in the middle of education levels. So that in most, you know, most states, you have 40 states right now in which one party controls um, the governorship and the legislature. And it's all based on whether or not they're highly educated or, or low, low levels of education. And so what makes these states unique uh, is the fact that they don't skew too much one way or the other on education levels. But you but uh, and, and, and so, you know, you've got this issue of abortion, which is a huge issue if it's, quote unquote, on the ballot. Um, but it's less of an issue if people in the community don't feel threatened by it. Um, and so right now, again, just focusing on these six states, um, Arizona is going to have abortion on the ballot um, uh, in November. And Nevada is quite possibly going to have it. Um, there's some other states, but they're not part of the six. Um, but if you take the three Midwestern states and the three sort of Sunbelt states, um, the Sunbelt states, I think, are, are going to be are more favorable uh, in general. Um, to Trump and the Republicans for three reasons. One is, um, from an economic standpoint, I think they feel uh, more pinched by what's been going on and remember more fondly 2019 with the economy under Trump. Um, the second is, if you look at the polling, particularly of swing voters, um, it's the sense that Democrats are just spending way too much money in government. Um, and that's a big part of the problem. And then the third are the the... I guess I would call them crime-related issues, the border and crime, um, as proxies um, for a sense of not trusting Democrats. And so as a result of that, um, I do think, you know, the only way that that Biden carried uh, Georgia in 2020 and the Democrats uh, held on to the Senate in 2020 was because of Trump, because of Trump on the ballot in 2020 
uh, and because of Trump's role in the special elections for the two Senate seats. Uh, but that state is still, I think, more leans Republican uh, mm. for those reasons that I cited. And I do think the same is for Arizona, particularly in the case of Arizona and Nevada. Um, you've got a large number of, 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 of non-whites who are lower educated voters who are moving increasingly towards Trump and the Republicans, making it more problematic for Democrats. Yeah, I mean, it's a close, it looks like it's going to be a close front thing. Either way, let's get back. I want to get back to third parties in a minute, because I've just got to think when there's two thirds of the voters don't want either of these people, there's a little more of a possibility of that than uh, conventional wisdom in DC has it. But let me hold off on that for a minute. Just just give people, I think, a sense, uh, not just, but of the events. I mean, normally, maybe this isn't a normal campaign and we can, uh, this, these things don't matter as much. Normally, we would say, well, what would happen? What's going to happen that's going to matter? Trump will pick a VP. There'll be conventions. There'll be debate. You know, there are usually these moments, right, where there's a huge amount of campaigning that makes no difference at all or makes a minute difference in whatever locality they're going to or whatever issue pops up. And sometimes it can be an important difference if it pops up and it's, it becomes a kind of big story. Uh, like the special counsel or whatever, but the predictable things, I mean, are any, are we just in a new world where all that kind of stuff matters so much less or do any, does any of those things, VP pick conventions, debates, what would you pick of those? Yeah. So it's, you know, it's a funny thing. I mean, the, the volatility of what's going on in our lives is, is at so much faster pace than anything that we're ever accustomed to. It's almost mind boggling to me. If you think about, where the world is now in February compared to where it was in June when we last got, last right. got together. Um, so on the one hand, the, the pace of what's happening is just in so much, uh, and, and events that are would appear to be significant are, are so much greater than anything we've ever seen in our lifetime. On the other hand, the more this stuff happens, the less things matter. Because the fundamentally... It's the tectonic plates of the divisions in our country based on tribal politics right now that, that overrides almost everything else. And so as a result of that, it's really hard to break the tectonic plates of everyone being dug in. Um, so back to your question, I would say the things I would watch are, on one is the economy. And whether, first of all, whether it improves, and I think people have a different view on that today than they might have had on Monday, hmm. based on the last round of, of inflation numbers that came out. Um, so the first, though, is the economy. Does it improve, continue to improve? People continue to, to be able to register in polling that they feel more confident about the economy. And then lastly, of course, on that is whether Biden gets any credit for that. Um, so that's, that's one issue. Second is um, the external events. Uh, and I do believe using the October 7th invasion and the follow-up, that it has had a significant political impact um, uh, uh, politically for, for Biden to the negative. Um, third would be on Trump. Uh, I think it's a combination of, of what happens in the legal process, if anything. Uh, and the polling does show if he is convicted of a crime before the election, it does have an impact on the outcome. Uh, and secondly, it's just Trump himself personally. Uh, uh, he, he's actually... He's not out very much, by the way. The very little secret is he's got his own 2020 basement strategy. Um, you know, if, again, the tectonic plates were so strong that, you know, the traditional, you go to 99 counties and campaign in Iowa, and they say, DeSantis did that and didn't carry a single county. Trump barely went to Iowa. And Trump barely campaigned in New Hampshire. Um, but when he is out, um, there is an erratic nature um, to his performance. Uh, and so I think we'll have to see that. Uh, and then in, lastly, in the uh, case of Biden, uh, uh, I think a lot of it's going to have to do with how he manages or doesn't, isn't able to manage the age issue. Um, and um, he's got to have the pressures of, of an 81 years old of not only running a country, uh, but running a campaign. And so you'll see a lot of that played out uh, through proxy things like debates. So when you have debates and Trump wants debates, he wants to engage Biden as much as possible in spontaneous events. And you can see the Biden White House is very concerned to put him out in non-controlled environments. They didn't do the Super Bowl interview. Um, so I think a lot of it, uh, for, for Biden, uh, I can tell you a story if you want about the Reagan White House, but I think for Biden, a lot of it is going to be just turn the sound off and watch him on TV and see how he looks. And and, and if you got a problem with how he looks, it's going to be a big problem in terms of trying to, to 
to manage his age problem. The Super Bowl interview thing kind of uh, freaked me out a little. And I wrote this little piece on Monday, which, you know, sort of suggested he might still step aside. It's a little late, quite late, but that the primary process would still be better, produce a likely a stronger candidate. I obviously could be wrong, but this may never be, most likely will never be tested, I suppose. But the Super Bowl interview, you mentioned earlier, people, you know, fragmented viewing, you know, people less engaged in politics and a fragmented political, obviously, universe. The one thing that Super Bowl did have the highest ratings ever, and that was predictable that it was going to have very high ratings. And people are happy when they're watching the Super Bowl generally, I think, and maybe they're worried about their own team if they're in San Francisco or Kansas City, but otherwise it's a perspective you get together. And that's always been such a gimme for the incumbent president, right? To have a pleasant interview with two sports announcers, uh, in this case on CBS, who presumably are going to ask totally nice questions to Biden and let him talk a little bit about how much he likes sports and rem reminiscing about playing football with his kids, whatever he wants, you know, um, who he's rooting for, who, did he grow up rooting for the Eagles? I mean, whatever, right? And uh, I, the fact that they didn't do that, I feel is now, maybe he just didn't want to do it and he's busy. I mean, there are a million things, right? But uh, maybe I'm wrong that it's always such an easy interview. But I feel like, geez, can you really go through, a, have a strategy for nine months where you're, you know, not do not, they couldn't stop him from going, the staff couldn't persuade him not to go out Thursday night when he was angry about the Robert Hur special counsel report. And that was not great. And then he didn't, he chose not to do the Super Bowl interview. And again, I want to make a you know, mountain out of a mole, obviously, in the big picture, no one's going to remember Super Bowl interview in 2024. But I, I, I don't know if that's sustainable for eight, nine months. Trump isn't exactly Mr. Accessibility either in certain ways. But you do get this. He's good at giving the impression that he's doing a lot of things. And he does friendly interviews a lot, at least. And therefore, you know, you, people kind of feel like he's on top of things. I don't, I, I don't well, know. Well, first of all, Trump was way more accessible to the press yeah. and not just the right wing press compared yeah. to Biden. Um, so let me just say this quickly on the interview. The, the, these are these interviews have become staples of Super Bowl Sunday. Um, they have changed over time and have become less soft interviews and, and harder interviews and more aggressive interviews. So that's changed. Uh, they had over 10 million people watch Trump when he was interviewed uh, uh, by Hannity before the Super Bowl a few years ago. Uh, so that's a lot of eyeballs. Uh, and remember that, um, and this may be one of the reasons, by the way, the Biden people didn't want to do it, that while 10 million people may have seen the Trump interview, there were probably four or five times that who saw a report on the interview without having seen the interview. And so I do think, you know, I think the Biden guys might say on his Thursday night appearance last week that if he took out a couple of, of, of bad snippets, conf confusing the president of Mexico and, and Egypt, and, he took out a couple of those bites, and it, and it was a, you know largely a positive interview. But you know they only cherry picked the 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 worst parts. And I think there is probably there probably was a concern um, that for the vast majority of people who aren't going to watch the interview, but are going to see the coverage of it, that they're going to pick out a couple of these kinds of stumbles that Biden has sort of made a trademark of interviews, and that would define it. The last thing I'll say though is, you know, Biden should be running like he's behind, a and the reason that he's running should run that way is because he is behind. Mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't mean you have to uh, do the 60 minute interview, but you better figure out if you're not going to do it, what you are going to do to break through to people. Yeah, that's well, that's well said. Um, what about, is it, I mean, the polarization, I guess, just trumps so much. And that's one message you've implicit or sometimes explicit point you've been making. I mean, it just is, that is the tectonic shape of American politics today, more polarization than God uh, that we've seen, certainly. I mean, the idea that you'd move up 15 points after a good convention, like Bush in 88, or or, or, or move, uh, you know, things would hinge on a debate in the last week. And what, Carter Reagan probably moved 10 points or something conceivably in that last week. It just seems inconceivable today. You know, things move two points and everyone's going crazy, right? So, well, so, you have you have a world now, you're right. Um, of high, what I call high floors, low ceilings, which is because of these tectonic plates are so baked in, it's hard to go below a certain number of support and it's hard to get above a certain number. Now, that's where the problem right now is, is that, that Trump, as I said earlier, is kind of bumping up to the high end of his ceiling uh, and Biden is at least, you know, bumping up to the bottom of his floor. Uh, and if you have all of a sudden, with a relatively even divided country, if 
one of the guys is at the high part of their seat of their uh, floor, and the others at the low part, or towards their ceiling. That gap becomes real and meaningful, and that's what you're seeing uh, in the polling. But I think that you know, in many ways, we have two Americas, and we use education as the sort of proxy for de defining these tribal differences in our country. But you know, it's 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 really cultural as much as it is economic. And there are economic, you know, impacts that affect the culture. And that's why it's so much more deep seated. I'll just tell you a quick story. So when Trump was president, I used to go to speak to uh, Democratic groups and they would, in the questions and answers, they'd say, I don't understand why um, uh, these, these non-college voters are voting for Trump. The economic policies of Trump favor the rich. You know, why are these idiots supporting him? Then I'd go to, to a um, Republican group and they would say, I don't understand these college, these young college graduates, the name of color. The economic opportunities have never been greater for them since Trump became president. Why are they supporting Trump? And the answer for both groups is the same, which is this is much more deep seated about who you are as a person, what your values are. Uh, that does correlate to education, but it's much deeper than that. And so as a result of that, if you believe that, it shows you how, why it's so difficult to get out of this relatively evenly divided country. So so in our previous conversation, you sort of thought this will eventually break open. It's kind of not really sustainable ultimately. And we and I, and I, I very much agree with that. That's a 2028 or 2032 thing or something like that. Uh, I gotta say, part of me thinks not not most to be most of me thinks we're gonna have a polarized election that'll be you know very much as you describe either it'll look like 2016 or 2020 and that'll be the kind of range of you know uh, outcomes uh, in those six states. But a little bit of me thinks I don't know if two thirds of the country doesn't want these guys and they're gonna both clinch. Let's assume their party's nomination. I mean Biden already has, but on March 5th on Super Tuesday, and they'll be the headlines on March 6th will be. Okay, it's over. Primaries are over. Let's assume Trump wins almost every state against Haley. Uh, and voters look up. They haven't really, in my, Sarah Longwell finds in her focus groups, voters don't quite understand. They haven't quite internalized that, like, this is the choice. There's still a little bit of, I don't know, this is like February. I mean, something will happen. The Democrats could switch candidates. Uh, maybe Trump, something would even happen with him. A little less of that, I'd say. Uh, I just feel like voters look up on March 6th and think, oh, my God, you know, and then it's April 6th and then it's May 6th and then it's June 6th. We don't even at the conventions yet. right? <laughs> you know, Biden's not getting any younger. Trump's not getting any, you know, less extreme in some ways. Um, I don't think. Um, I don't know. Is a third party thing possible? Independent candidates, candidacy possible even this year? Could the could the tectonic plates be totally you know, powerful and strong until something really happens. And I don't know, I, I just feel a little bit like that's more possible than than I would have thought a few months ago, but. Well, I think it's more possible. I mean, look, I, I, I going back to your first point, I mean, young voters think quite differently about issues and institutions and politics than baby boomers and the greatest generation. And when they, you know, the largest population group in America now are, are millennials and Gen Z, and they'll be the largest voting group uh, by the end of the decade. Uh, and if you look at the polling, the research that's been done, um, Harvard's done a lot of this, where the young Republicans think quite differently than older Republicans on issues they care about, and the same with young Democrats. So I do think we'll get out of this cul-de-sac when the younger generations take over, uh, and they're not going to be fighting the same fights we've had for the last 50 years. Um, and I do think over the long term, I think third party candidates can be um, much more viable because I don't you know, think about all institutions that the young people have dismissed and no longer believe in. And that would put the political parties right at the top of that list. But getting back in real time to now, back to your <laughs> question, uh, I think one thing that's different uh, for a lot of people uh, is I think people learn a lesson. Democrats learned a lesson in 2016. Uh, that when you don't vote or you vote for a third party or fourth party or fifth party, it's not free. And there are real political implications or, or, or policy implications by a protest vote and all that. That's not to say that in February, March, April, and May or June that people aren't going to maybe support third and fourth parties, fifth parties. Um, but I do think 
for some people, the 2016 experience will ultimately um, impact when they have to get to a decision point. As most of the time, if you look at the history of third party candidacies, um, the numbers go down as you get closer to the election. Um, but eight, nine months out, two candidates you don't like, I mean, why not as a proxy um, say you're for a third, fourth party? And I think, particularly for Democrats, the third party uh, option is uh, also a reflection that they could have dissatisfaction enough while they don't go out and vote third or fourth or fifth party. Uh, they just may not vote. Uh, and the other thing I'll just mention is I alluded to it earlier when uh, back with Reagan and took, took um, um, control of the race in the last 10 days in 1980 after the first debate. Um, it, I think it was October 28th. Um, if you have a debate this October 28th, over half the country would have already voted. So hmm. in terms of when is when, uh, it starts right after Labor Day. People are going to be voting around America, across a number of states, all throughout September and well into October. And by Election Day in 2020, I think 68 percent of the people, I think, had already voted. So as you're thinking about, quote unquote, nine months into the election, you really need to back it up uh, because they're really going to feel um, uh the deadline of encroaching because if you live in Michigan and some of these early voting states are actually voting in September. And then if you look a few weeks before that is the Democratic convention uh, um, in Chicago. And so I think in, in August is going to be kind of like the real truth test for people about what they're going to do. Interesting. Yeah, you're right. I hadn't really focused on the, the backside. I've thought a lot about the current calendar and the primary. I want to ask you about it one, uh, briefly as we wrap up the primary, you know, what the, what would happen if Biden stepped aside? I've thought a fair amount of the primary calendar. I thought a fair amount about the ballot access challenges for independent candidates and third parties, which are, are not actually as prohibitive as people think. I, and I'm not a big fan of the third party option. God knows after 2016, I just think people here in D.C. underestimate a little how much sentiment there would be out there. But maybe it would dissipate. It would be a lot of excitement in April, you know, and then by June. Well, I think a lot of it would depend on who it is. Yeah, yeah. And, um, uh, you know, the third party candidacies historically that had an impact um, were kind of like movement candidacies. And you know, Wallace in 68, which is right. the last time a third party candidate carried states, I mean, regardless of what you thought of his politics, he had clear politics. And if you look at McCarthy in the 68 primary, right. you look at Perot in 92, uh, I mean, he, he actually stood for something. So, you know, it's easier said than done when you get real about who is a third party candidate going to be and, and who's the vice president. But I don't think it's going to be enough to just say I'm not the other guys. Yeah, that's interesting. But it does, I mean, the pushing back of the calendar on the, on the back end does make that Democratic convention like weirdly important, perhaps. I mean, uh, uh, those of us who've been intrigued by the notion of Biden stepping aside have also been intrigued by the notion of the excitement of the open, you know, write-ins in the primaries and, and a lot of uncommitted delegates and an open convention and everyone I know. You well, know, the problem like, is, um, <laughs> uh, I think it's true for Republicans. I know it's true for Democrats, uh, which which the last time that the convention served that purpose of nominating someone based on who's on this, the, house, the convention floor was 68. Yeah, that's a... And, Unfortunate memory for Democrats. Yeah, I, and so that I was such a that. disastrous. But let me, uh, can I, so let me make this, I mean, since everyone, so I read this little piece and I said, you know, I, it's funny that the convention is in Chicago. But you know what the convention was in Chicago? Roosevelt in 1932. And I believe Roosevelt was nominated on the third ballot. And it was very much of a, you know, weeding out of candidates, some of whom there weren't really primaries then, but who were favorite sons and and so forth. Lincoln was nominated in Chicago in 1860 on the fourth ballot. So maybe multi-ballot conventions in Chicago are good. Then someone, of course, 19,000 well, 9, people, 9, people wrote in and said, are you kidding? What about 68? Yeah. But I would make this point about 68, just not to obsess too much on the replacing Biden thing. Huber, it was a horrible mess. The whole thing, Robert Kennedy was tragically assassinated, McCarthy, Humphrey, the violence in Chicago, Dick Daly, the whole nightmare, right? Still, at the end of the day, Humphrey almost won in 68. And I believe Humphrey would have ran ran better in 68 than Lyndon Johnson would have don't sure. you, as, as the incumbent. Now, Biden's not Johnson. We don't have the Vietnam War going on. I understand all that. But I, I think people, it's so much easier, of course, to see the, the risk of the unknown and, and to say, look, let's stick with the known and and that's, you know, we're going to make it through. And, and we, Democrats may well do it. And I 
frankly would hope they would do it if they if that's the path they well i think stick on but i don't know do you think i just i'm struck maybe a bit just more broadly just let you talk about it i mean the convention with biden and harris it's kind of a boring i mean how do they make that exciting in 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 august at least trump gets to pick a vp in july right well i think uh i I mean i'll respond to everything you said let me just take your last question first i i I don't think I don't think the bar that let's assume nothing changes, and then I'll talk about if something does change. But yeah, assuming right. nothing changes, I, the the bar that 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 Biden's going to have to clear at the convention is a, one of reassurance, and that he's up to it. And he's not going to be exciting. He doesn't need to be exciting, but he does need to reassure. But going back to the kind of the land of what would happen if something happened for a moment. Um, the, the big point about 68, though, and what happened after was they changed the rules and and and, uh, and made the role of convention delegates much different than, than they used to be. They actually used to pick nominees at conventions. Um, uh, and back to your point on Humphrey, I think if he'd broken with Johnson in July instead of October in Vietnam, he probably would have won. Uh, but let's just take two scenarios for a moment of um, uh Something happens to Trump or something happens to Biden. Yeah. If something happens to Trump and you go to a convention, um, the, the, the party of Trump is the party of Trump. So those delegates on that floor are completely MAGA Republicans. In addition, of course, to the fact that despite the fact there's still a primary um, for the Republican nomination and 90 percent of the delegates haven't been picked, Trump has already taken over the RNC. So. Right. If something were to happen at a Republican convention, I don't know what they would do, except I do know that the MAGA forces are going to decide what happens. I think it's quite different on the Democratic side. Um, you know, when you're when you're uh, when you're as a party coalescing behind Biden, it's largely a vote for Biden is is largely or as the organizing principle about being for Biden is to stop Trump. And as I think I've mentioned before to you. He's the first person elected president since 1988 um, when George H.W. Bush got elected for essentially a Reagan third term, which I'm sure you remember quite well. Um, um, Biden is the first guy since Bush to get elected without a political base. Uh, and so his base of support, if there is one, is, is, is an anti-Trump support. So if you take these people that have coalesced as a party, and the party is more of a federation of interests, really, than it is uh party that's got a narrow focus like Republicans now, it's unclear what those delegates would do uh, at the convention if it, if it got to that uh, because of the motivation of how they got there. So interesting that, and maybe we'll close on this, was you think a lot about the parties as institutions as well as the, you know, who's the candidate this year. The parties seem so different now and, and different, A, they're each different from what they were, but B, I mean, you have a Democratic Party, which really is a coalition of interest groups and views and governors and you so if, if biden just steps aside there'd be people who prefer newsom people who prefer whitmer shapiro vice president harris there are teachers unions delegates and there'd be you know various kinds of uh, ideological groups and moderates versus uh you know aoc fans and you know people would like me would say hey look how swazi won in long island by being a moderate and other people would say no you need the energy of the bernie sanders whatever it'd be more like i feel like that's more like a traditional american political party though in some ways the republican party really is i mean when people say cult of personality they're sort of missing i think the key it, it is a movement though of a kind that you don't see that often in america i mean the, the degree to which it's is based around one person trump but then by now it's got a pretty big associated bunch of not just issues but attitudes and and sort of uh, stances towards institutions and towards uh, the past and repudiation of the recent past of that party uh, in a really dramatic way, right? I mean, the Trump people hate the Bush and McCain and Romney people more than they hate Democrats to some degree. Well, I don't know. So say a little bit about this, these two parties. Yeah, like, I, I don't quite know how that all works right. out, but. Uh, You're absolutely right. And they are completely in different places. And, you know, if you take Yogi Bear's old saying, if there's a fork in the road, take it. The Republicans have taken their fork in the road. And they are now more of a working class party, more of a nationalist party, more of a MAGA party. They are. And, and so in a sense there, it's 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 kind of a, a narrow base of support, but quite deep. I think on the Republic on the Democratic side, uh uh back to the Yogi Bear quote, um, they haven't taken the fork in the road. And in fact, 
uh, is something I've written on and I haven't published it yet. Uh, there's going to be an enormous reckoning for the Democratic Party uh, that's going to happen um, the day after the election, regardless of whether Trump is elected or not. And uh, you've got a combination of forces uh, to um, um, that are that are really going to explode the day after the election. Uh, what is the nature, as you said earlier, about the nature of the Democratic Party, which is really I call it almost a federation of interests, whether you know you're motivated by gun control or you know, pro-choice or you know Black Lives Matter or unions or the environment. Um, but what you've got is a party that's got really stunted growth. And the reason it's been stunted is uh, the, the the Clintons, Bill and Hillary, and the Obama Biden administration have now controlled and dominated American politics for over 30 years. Hmm. So this entire generation of Democratic elected officials had never had an opportunity to rise. Secondly, uh, Obama, who got elected, um, is essentially challenging the Democratic uh, establishment. Um, when he got elected president, uh, he, could, he didn't care about the Democratic Party. He didn't care about Democratic candidates. He never like took all his his data file of millions of supporters and went to the DNC. Um, the Democrats had lost made historic losses in 2010 um, due to the negligence. And over the course of eight years of Obama, um, Democrats lost almost a thousand legislative state, state legislative candidates. You know, got, got eviscerated in the House and the Senate uh, controls of of these legislatures. And so there's really the 2010s was a lost generation, a lost decade for Democratic elected officials across the country. And as I said earlier, it fed to this lost generation. Um, now, since I would say, lastly, since uh, 2016, so we're clocking in now eight years, um, right. the organizing principle of the Democratic Party has not been what you're for, but what you're against. And it's been a party that's been organized singularly to deal and beat with Donald Trump. And so you've got this sort of mishmash of forces that have been building that are going to explode the day after the election about what does it mean to be a Democrat? I mean, my slight maybe uh, caveat on what you think of this of, of that account, which is very, very interesting. I mean, particularly I want to say how important it is what you say about the sort of uh, Clintons and then Obama Biden dominating for so long that they did probably suppress a whole generation of people whom we know even who've left office by now. They were kind of, they rose and fell. On the other hand, of course, as you say, anti-Trump was the dominant, it was, was key for the last six, eight years. On the other hand, the Democrats have produced, I mean, if you just came down from Mars and looked at, okay, they got Shapiro in Pennsylvania, they got Whitmer in Michigan, they got Polis in Colorado, Newsom in California. They got pretty impre very impressive younger members of the House, some of them not quite in the Senate yet, but they, they'll they get there. Abigail Spanberger will probably be governor of Virginia in 2025. That's not so. They have actually what looks more like a normal bench, somewhat diverse, actually, and and, and somewhat, and there are people on the left. I probably mentioned a little more of the moderates. Uh, I don't know, I, I, but that's not, that Biden running for re-election, again, I don't want to obsess on this, is sort of putting a cork over that. I do feel like, yeah, there's, there's a real kind of, and the question would be, to remo is removing that cork healthier now or or not? And obviously it's unlikely to happen, so we're going to have to wait. But um, I don't know, I mean, that's an interesting question of sort of how much, uh, there uh, is there a healthy Democratic Party beneath the surface? But there still will be fights, as you say, on a whole bunch of issues, right? I mean, for me as a foreign policy hawk, it's encouraging to see how many sort of Hubert Humphrey or even Scoop Jackson Democrats there are floating around in Congress, apparently, right? They're all voting for aid to Ukraine and the Republicans are opposing it. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of my friends think, oh, the left's got all the momentum and the energy among young people. So I think you're right. The Democrats are have, have, have to resolve their future. But also the Trump side is kind of unstable, right? I mean, ultimately, Trumpism is not it's not clear that it's a stable uh, movement. It's it, it's more of a movement and less of a coalition. So I guess both parties could be, I mean, 2025 could be a very interesting year, no matter who wins on both sides, right? Well, I think, look, I think it's going to be a new era, no matter what. Uh, I, I, I think that Trumpism without Trump is not the same as Trumpism with Trump. But I think the basic contours of the Republican Party will be the same with or without Trump, hmm. which is working class, nationalists, 
I would consider it more xenophobic. Um, so you think we don't go, they don't go back. The, I don't think they go back. My, but, I'm not that way, but some of my Republican friends who still yeah. want to hang, hang on to hope, they're, yeah. they're, that's not that's not coming so, back, right? So let me address what you just said in two things. First of all, there's been in this eight-year period kind of an unspoken bargain, which is the left gets to drive the policy direction of the Democratic Party, but the Democrats get to nominate moderate candidates. And if you look at the impact of, Bernie Sanders on the 2016 election and the change of policy positions that Hillary took to get nominated. You look at Biden's 2020 primary, you look at positions he took as president of the United States. He, he, the, the United States senator that served for 35 years is a completely different guy on issues than what he did as president. And if you compare the Biden presidency on policy compared to the Obama presidency on policy is way far to the left. And the reason not why foreign, was- Not on foreign policy, though. I'd say the opposite on yeah. foreign policy. Well, it depends what your definition of foreign policy is. I, I think on trade- Well, trade, uh, no, you're right. The international trade. agenda, yeah, fair enough, economically. Fair um, so, so they've had this bargain. And you look at the impact that Elizabeth Warren had on all the, the appointments in the Biden administration on all the regulators. So- They've had this sort of bargain, which hasn't been, it's going to need to be litigated going forward, um, which is about, uh, you know, progressivism versus the moderation. Um, but the last thing I'll say is I do agree with what you said about Whitmer and Newsom and all these people, but just understand how we got there. It, it was 15 years of being in a political wilderness for Democrats following the 2010 midterm elections to get to a point that you could rehab to restock a bench. Now, part of the bench got restocked in part because of what the crazy Republican right-wingers did in power. So you take a place like Michigan that that is now controlled by Democrats in the governorship and the state legislature for the first time since the mid-1980s. That's the first time Democrats have had control of the state legislature. Look what's going on in Wisconsin. Yeah. So you're right about uh, uh, what's happening now for the Democrats. But they're coming out of a 15-year valley. And then the question, of course, becomes, well, let's see what they got, right? It's going to start happening the day after the election, whether Biden wins or loses. And that's where you find out who people are made of. And they, a, a, But part of the problem Democrats have had is these, this whole generation of elected officials have never had the opportunity right. to step forward and see what they got. I mean, Bill Clinton ran in 91 for president because no one was going to run because everyone knew Bush was going to get reelected. Hmm. And so Biden, so, so Clinton ran. Well, Clinton was able to demonstrate because of that opportunity that he had the right stuff. But you look at the 2016 field that was primary in Trump and all these people were strong on paper uh, and they just didn't have the right stuff. But you can't, you can't find this stuff out without an opportunity. And this is a party that has not given people an opportunity now for over two decades. Yeah, it does mean that there's you know, we have this incredibly polar, both, it's funny, but both polarization in terms of the two, you know, World War I trench warfare sort of situation and status, uh, status quo or a static situation at the top where we're literally seeing the renomination of one 81 year old president and the renomination of the preceding previous president from the other party who's 77. So has there ever been a kind of more, I don't know what you'd call it, a backward looking situation to have two, two, two ma massive phalanxes, each being led by people more than 75. And then beneath the surface, one has the impression and in the real country, in the real world, massive instability and, and, and fluidity in terms of where we might be going, right? It's a very, it seems to me, it's an untenable situation, right? Don't yeah, well, I, 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 I'll, tr I'll be brief here. I don't want to go too long. Yeah, no, we, Just two things I'd say. First is, 100 years from now, when people look back at Trump and what's going on here, they're not going to be talking about Trump. What they're going to be talking about is what was going on in America that enabled someone like Donald Trump to become president. So I think Trump is more the symptom of what's going on in the country than the cause. And, and in terms of like trying to explain like where we are and what's going on, I'll just uh, really quickly, we're going through the biggest transition in our country since the late 1800s. So we went from a agrarian society to an industrial society. It's a 30 or 40 year transition. In the short term, you have a few winners and a lot of losers. 
Um, we're going through the same kind of transition now from a 20th century top-down manufacturing industrial society to a 21st century digital and global one. It's the biggest transition in over 100 years. We're in a transitionary moment in our history right now. 10 out of the last 12 election cycles, the country's voted to either change control of the House, Senate, and or President. And so they're voting against who's in power, not who's for in power. Um, and, and we are in this transition period that's going to, we're going to break out of this transition period as we settle into this 21st century digital global world. You see all kinds of things that are happening that are going to open up opportunities for people they haven't had. In, in, in the turn of this last century, we created high schools in America to train people to work on these machines. You're seeing, as an example now, companies and state governments all across America that are now waiving the requirement that someone's a college graduate to get a job because they that's the only that's the only way they could in the past figure out if someone's qualified but being a college graduate has nothing to do with filling these jobs now so we're train we're transitioning and so this has been a 20 year transition due to the economic changes the technological changes the demographic changes all coming together at the same time but in the wide swath of history, 20 years is nothing. But when you're living in the middle of it, you feel it's like unbelievable chaos. So the point is, we are going to push through this. And we are going to come to the other side. And a lot of it's going to have to do with the, the baby boomers and the remnants of the greatest generation dying off. And, this, and these emerging generations are going to take power. And, and we're going to change and we're going to get out of this. But we're still going to be in this barrel for several more cycles. And that's what Trump and Biden represents, which is our transitionary figures that that as a country, we're not politics are lagging indicators. We will never get to the other side politically until we get to the other side in terms of who we are as a country and what people care about. Once we do that, the politics will change. And that's why early beginning next next decade, the issues that poll well right now that don't matter in elections, like in climate control gun control, abortion, so all these social libertarian issues, they're going to be driving the outcome of elections next decade because the people that are going to be running this country care about that. And these are the emerging younger generations, but they're not quite at the tipping point yet of taking over. Now, that's really well said. And on the whole, hope, more hopeful, I just have to assume we make it through this rather rocky period. Well, Bill, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you, I know we're wrapping up here. I always... So you give a speech, there are three roles that I'm sure you're familiar. familiar. One is you got to show up on time. Two is you don't want to offend your host. And, and three is you want to have them feeling better after the speech than before. Right. And I had had a really hard time on that third one. I'm, I'm not so great on the second one either, by the way. But <laughs> I've had a really hard time of trying to figure out how you leave people feel a little better after the speech than before. And there are two ways that I do that. One's the positive way that I just described in terms of where we're headed as a country. And you know, people joke about millennials and Generation Z. They're, they're actually way more aligned with the greatest generation in the sense of communitarianism and about caring more about community and what their values are. So that's a very positive way, I think, to feel good about the long-term future of the country. And then there's a negative way to feel positive, which is despite all our problems, I'd rather have America with our problems compared to any other country in the world by far. I mean, we, we have a lot of problems, but my God, we have strengths, which is largely built around our people. And at least up until now, around a legal system that's independent. Uh, and, and also the, the, the entrepreneurial spirit that made America to what it is, is still the DNA of our country. So I'm quite optimistic if we can get to the other side um, that we're going to be able to turn the corner and reach our potential again. But we're in this three-decade trough right now of, of going from one era to another and getting new institutions that are responsive to people, what they care about, so that we can rebuild trust in our country and our all of our institutions, but particularly our governmental and political ones. That's good. No, I'm going to think a lot about this somewhat hopeful vista and vision over the next eight months, as I look at the actual <laughs> candidates and choices we face and debates and everything else, conventions we're going to have. Uh, but it, no, look, it's a very important point and a good point that you make. And it's not just for 
leaving people happy after one gives a speech, though I, I agree with that. I'm I'm falling short on that too. You know, they always do want you to leave the audience, right? The, you know, these people didn't come to hear, hear you just get them, you know, leave them depressed, right? They're going out to play golf after your lunch speech and they want to feel be in a good mood. It's like I'll do my best, you know, but but you did your best. And you and it was and it's a very serious point. It's a good point. But meanwhile, we'll need to get together maybe maybe what midsummer, see where we are. What, what would be the time where we'll really know much more about the shape of things to come before the conventions, I yeah, guess. So, you know, I remember when I was in the White House, you always want to be strategic and not tactical, right? And a big part of that is planning, going from election day and working backwards and then looking at, to the extent you can, what are the phases that we're, we're dealing with and how are we going to win the phases? Now, this was over 30 years ago. I wrote a speech in in the summer of 95 about the phases of the election that that I, I gave that same speech for 15 months because the phases were the phases they never change. It's a little harder in this environment to do that. But but my my well, I haven't thought a great deal about this, but my the way I would look at this in terms of tr tranches or phases that I would want to try to control if I were in the White House is. We'll have the, uh, you mentioned Super Tuesday. I don't know what the date will be, but sometime probably in early to mid-March, there'll be the consensus that the election, general election is starting. It's the formality. There's no Nikki Haley. There's whatever. So we're going to have a, this is the beginning of the election, early March. That's one phase. I, I guess I would probably make a second phase maybe to early June or something like that, roughly. Uh, mid June, and that's really kind of. I think we'll know where the court stuff is with Trump. I think we're going to have a pretty good idea where the economy is headed for towards September and Election Day at that point. Uh, and so we'll move into the summer with the Republican convention and the Democratic convention. It's sort of a second phase, and then I think the third phase will be late August, immediately following the Democratic convention in Chicago. That third tranche will be the the general the final the final lap for the general election. As I mentioned earlier, when uh, you'll see people voting, a lot of people voting in September and certainly by mid October. So that's how I would look at the cycle in those three um, phases. No, it's very very helpful, really. And uh, we'll get together maybe at the end of uh, maybe in June, I think, and let's see where we are in the economy. The a course, lifetime from now, the can and it will be. God knows where. So yes, you say last time we talked. October 7th hadn't happened and all kinds of other things and Trump was in question and Biden might not run. So Doug Sosnick, thank you uh, very much for joining me today. Really a fascinating conversation. Great. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.